let me just introduce Dr. Edgar. So first we have uh, Dr. Paul Edgar. He's the Associate Director of uh, the William P. Clements Jr. Center for National Security at the University of Texas at Austin. Holds a PhD in Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures from University of Texas and studies historical origins of diplomacy, war and strategy in pre-classical antiquity. So let's get started. Dr. Edgar, you have the floor. If you have any remarks, we can get into Q&A soon after that. Okay, sure. Um, I'll just I'll just talk for a few minutes so that everyone uh, has a little bit better understanding of my background, professionally, uh, and academically. And then and then I'll throw um, you know I'll throw out a couple of potential um, themes for uh, for discussion. But I'll, we'll just take the Q and A however it comes. It may be related to the, the things I suggest. Um, uh, it, it may not, and, and whatever suits your audience. Um, so, so first, let me let me thank everybody who is participating right now. I think we're at we're we're heading near seventy total participants. Um, it'll probably go a little bit higher and then dip. I know how these things are. That's uh, that's all fine. Um, but but let me thank you for your interest in international affairs. And we you know we we have different terms um, for these things, and I'm not sure you know what. Uh, you know, the school that you come from or the teacher that you have or the materials that you use may use different, uh, different um, terms because different terms are in vogue for different reasons at different times and, and they all usually have a purpose. But let me just thank you for your, uh, the term I will use is international affairs. So let me thank you for your interest in it uh, because it's hugely important and it's not going away. Uh, so we need young people to be thinking about these things, to be engaged in these things uh, and, and to be humble enough to be learning, uh, not just from history, but also to be paying attention to current events. A lot of times, especially with uh, model UN um, events, we're very focused on, uh, on the moment, right? What is, uh, what is hot right now? Uh, so maybe my emphasis here should be on history, um, that, uh, um, th that it's important that young people like you uh, do pay attention to current events and, and understand them as best uh, as any of us can, um, but, uh, but also learn how to contextualize them uh, uh, historically and learn how to, um, how to use analogies uh, responsibly. Um, because there's a lot of power in that. It opens up options that uh, for policy, for diplomacy, and, and if necessary for war, um, it opens up options that we often close to ourselves simply because we're not aware of them or at least not aware enough of them. So, um, so please dig in, uh, dig in this, you know, this, uh, this weekend um, uh, or the, this week of activities. Uh, and for, for the rest of your high school career, and if you follow on in college, uh, studying these sorts of things, um, just uh, uh, I encourage you to em embrace it as best you can, and, um, and we're happy that you're here. Okay, so, so thanks. Um, number two is, is I'll just talk a little bit about my background. Uh, my background professionally, I was in the, uh, the United States Army for, uh, for a little bit over 20 years, um, uh, was doing army activities and training for, for about 25 years, uh, if you include things that, that occurred during college. And most of my time was spent uh, in operations. Um, and I'll, I'll try to minimize the jargon. Um, uh, but what we mean by operations is, is that I was doing the army's work, okay? I was not, I was not, uh, I did not spend most of my time uh, as an advisor uh, to, um, or as a strategist to, uh, to senior civilian or military leaders. I did a little bit of that, um, probably a total of two years. Um, so less, less than 10% of my time. Most of my time was simply executing um, parts of United States foreign policy in different parts of the world, uh, all the way from Asia, uh, to Europe, to the Middle East. Um, did get to Africa a little bit, uh, but just Northern Africa, not, uh, um, not Sub-Saharan Africa uh, or other parts. Um, and I spent time, uh, some, of that, um, some of that living uh, for, for months or years at a time, 
spent time in over 40 countries uh, around the world. And I was an infantry officer. Most of my time was spent in airborne units and, uh, and ranger uh, special operations units. So that was, that was what I did. I, I, I executed parts of United States uh, policy towards uh, different people, different countries in different parts of the world. Um, and, and, uh, and I learned a lot. Okay, for me, the Army was, uh, was a vehicle for education. Um, and, uh, and I'm grateful for it uh, for, for a number of reasons, but certainly for that, for that reason. Uh, I, I decided to retire from the Army uh, earlier than I uh, was certainly much earlier than I was required to do. Because uh, it, in my time, I recognized how much the academic world had to offer um, our conduct of international affairs. And so, so I intentionally separated from the army or retired from the army a little after 20 years, uh, earned my PhD here at the University of Texas in Middle Eastern languages and cultures. And then uh, following that, thankfully was able to get this really, really neat job where I get to work with fantastic students like Ross here uh, at UT uh, on a daily basis. Right now we're of course Zooming on a daily basis, not, not daily with Ross, but uh, working with, with each other uh, over Zoom. Um, but, uh, but when we're not under these circumstances, working with fantastic students like Ross and you um, in the audience every day, talking about all of these things and thinking about them, right? Thinking about them, learning from history, learning from political science, learning from IR theory, uh, heck, learning from uh, the STEM um, disciplines, learning from a lot of things, uh, so that we can do these things better, right? So that we can engage with the rest of the world in a as constructive a manner as possible. Uh, so those are the two parts of sort of my professional life, you know, professional and then and then academic. Uh, and I've been in this role for about a year and a half. Um, so, uh, so okay, so that's so that's the summary of my my career. And I'm can, I'm happy to talk about different parts of that um, in more detail if you're interested. If you're interested, I, I spent lots of time in Iraq. Uh, a little bit of that time was was uh, in governance, okay, in in the coalition provisional authority uh, as a security. Essentially, you know, I don't want to compare myself to the national security advisor, but I had that role in Iraq to uh, to senior civilian staff in the Bremer. Um, uh, in the coalition provisional authority that Ambassador Bremer was was in charge of, um, but I also spent a lot of time in combat in Iraq and a lot of time in combat in Afghanistan. And if those things are meaningful to you and helpful, I'm, I'm happy to expand. But the the two things that you know the two things that um, I offer to you to think about today, and I'm happy to discuss it uh, if your questions go in this direction. Um, there's two of them, and they're and they're, they're very different. Number one is the nature of violence, okay? And I wanna, uh, I wanna take this up right now because, uh, because we've seen it in our own, uh, within our own borders, right? We saw the, uh, um, uh, the mob in the Capitol uh, just, uh, just a little over a week ago. Um, and, uh, and, and what we saw there, um, and I'm not talking about, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to stay apolitical here. Um, what we saw there was violence moving out of control. We quickly got control of it, okay? Um, make no mistake that, uh, that once the law enforcers in that part of our country get organized, there's not a lot of people that can stop them from, uh, from, from bringing order to, uh, to whatever is going on. Okay, uh, but we saw uh, within our own borders um, uh, the uh, a little bit of the uncontrolled or chaotic nature of violence, and and I spent the better part of of my life applying violence. Okay, uh, and so what I saw last week is what I've been seeing for my whole life is that there is an element um, within the nature of violence that will always be out of our control. We can get very, very good at its application, but there's always a little bit 
that's out of control. And you saw that last week. We, uh, we've seen it actually for, for almost a year now in different ways, but, but, uh, but it got everybody's attention um, uh, maybe more than, uh, 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 more than the rest of the year. It got everyone's attention at the Capitol. Um, so I want you to think about that and think about as, as people who are, uh, who are interested in national security, as people who are interested in diplomacy, um, consider the, the sort of this unchanging nature of violence that part of it always remains outside of our control so that if we need to use it, we better be very certain that we need to use it knowing that we won't be able to control all, all of the results. Uh, again, even if we get very good at it, and we and we can be very good at it. Um, the other thing that I'd like you to think about, uh, think you know, if you look at, I, I spent a little bit of time and I looked at the website for um, for for your conference, right? For all the different events, I want you to think about all of the things that the UN is involved in. And I want you to think uh, not not just now, but I want you to carry this with you for for the fact for the rest of the time that you're you know that you're involved or interested in any of these things um think of all the things that the un is involved in how many of those things can it be very good at just just consider that okay consider that for a while how many of these things and and all of them in some ways are good causes all right or good reasons but um but how big can this organization get? How sprawling can it get and still be effective in the things that, that count the most? And how do we decide what counts the most? Okay, th these, are, these are hard questions for, for the senior members in and around the UN, um, but they're things that you should be considering as well, okay? Because some, someday those people will be uh, and I don't, I don't wish them ill, okay, but everybody dies at some point. So these people are going to die and move on and, and be gone and you're going to be in their place. What is the fundamental business of the UN and how does it make sure that it does it well? So those are the two things that I, that I present to you. And again, if we don't talk about those, great. If we do, great. But uh, I'll turn it over to you, Ross, to uh, MC uh, and manage Q&A. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna go to a few questions here. Hopefully, some more trickle in. I have some questions for you myself that maybe we'll be able to get to. We have um, first uh, Queen Marie Antoinette. He's uh, delegates are named after their uh, their characters in some of the crisis committees. But um, so she asked. I did not have uh, that crisis committee back in the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things have definitely expanded <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Here at Hamun, but um, so she asked. They mentioned in your introduction that you studied or taught uh, pre-antiquity history. How has that study impacted you, uh, your view, uh, and how you interact with the world? Right. So, well, uh, well, I think a couple of things, um, and, I, and I'll try to be brief so that uh, so that we can go through a number of questions. But this is this is a great question. So, so, uh, so first of all. Um, for a lot of reasons that I won't go into, our understanding of diplomacy, our understanding of politics begins in what we call the classical era. And that's just a term to say, hey, it begins with, with ancient Greece, okay? Um, what I, uh, but we've discovered a lot of stuff over the past 150 years um, that predates Greece. And so my, you know, my, my um, role academically is to start to bring a lot of that political history to, to light. Um, now, what's the point of that? Um, is there anything new in that? Well, there's fresh material, but I think in general, the things that I, that I gained from, from pre-classical antiquity, from the ancient Near East, uh, it, is much, it really reinforces much about what we understand um, about politics uh, um, from, from the other sources, right? So, so most of what I think I bring to bear is simply a reinforcement of much of the things that, that uh, many of the things that we, um, that we already know, uh, not necessarily you know, new, um, 
you know, really, really brand new insights into how politics, how people relate to one another, uh, you know, whether it's nationally or internationally, whether it's in diplomacy or at war. Um, so that's what I think I bring. And the, the, the other thing is that, um, you know, our uh, much of what we have going on in the Middle East um, is indeed still connected. Mo most of it, I would say, is connected to uh, to the uh, uh, to the rise of Islam. Um, but there's still a lot that is that is pre-classical, and uh, and so just understanding the weight of that history and its impact on the way people think and operate and make decisions in that area, I think, can be helpful. So those are the two things I think that at least that come to mind right now. Awesome. Well, we have uh, two other questions. They're kind of similar. First one's from uh, Roger of Mortimer. Uh, what is your suggestion to a, pros a prospective student at UT for studying international relations? And the second one um, is from Grace. Uh, what would you recommend uh, for students who are interested in foreign policy careers more broadly um, right. to learn more about now? Right. So, so I think, you know, I, I just think history, uh, that's, and, and I'm, I'm revealing my bias here, okay? I'm re re revealing my bias um, in terms of academic disciplines. Um, I think history is the best teacher in this case. Uh, so, so if I were sort of designing, you know, my, how, how do you make Ender the diplomat, right? And, and sort of the Ender's game, how do you find Ender, right? And develop that, that person so that they're, the best they can possibly be when they get into a particular role. So um, it, it would be history based. Uh, it, it would not be an IR theory. Um, so it wouldn't be an IR department. It wouldn't be political science. So it wouldn't be a government department. It would be in history, but you got to find a school uh, in the University of Texas. We can do a fantastic job. Okay. I'm, I'm, so there's a, a, there's a plug. <laughs> All right. So um, in understanding international and diplomatic history, especially of the last uh, couple hundred years. Um, because there's really a rich history, uh, just even just a rich recent history in all of these things. Now I, now, I think highly of political scientists, I think highly of IR theorists, um, especially the, you know, the, the very good ones. But one of the things that all of us find, especially when you get to the, to the level of a PhD and, and in, you, know, you become a professor and all that sort of thing, is that political science starts to become more historical and IR theorists start to become more historical. If they don't, then in some ways they separate themselves from, uh, from actively participating and in, 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 in being beneficial to, uh, to what's going on now. And they become more siloed within their particular discipline and more detached from, um, I don't wanna say detached from reality, but detached from, um, from shaping in a positive, constructive way, um, the way uh, uh, the way that the United States interacts with the world now. If you're willing to work with policymakers, if you're willing to work with with students who are policy students, okay, um, uh, who are getting a policy master's degree, for example, and we we offer that here at the LBJ School for those who go to grad school. Um, many of you already know of great programs in Georgetown, George Washington, uh, Johns Hopkins, Sice, right? Those, those are the three that usually stand out because they happen to be right in the middle of, of DC and they benefit from, from that location in a, a number of different ways. So, but it would start with history. It would start with learning classical diplomatic history, learning classical international history, uh, um, particularly uh, of the modern era. Great. Well, we have another question from Germany. Um, so Germany says, similar to how we look to ancient Greece and many ancient Western civilizations for the beginning of Western thought, are there any Eastern ideas that you feel hold important places in our society today? Um, yes. And let me, so let me, uh, but you did, so, so I'll say this though, when you get to class, when you get to class, you know, sort of uh, when you get to, to um, classical Greece, right, you find people who are actually thinking about these things in a, in a didactic way. Um, 
you don't find those, you don't find any sources like that um, for the most part. Uh, you find hints here and there of, of what people think and you kind of find hints of a philosophy of, uh, of, of political leadership, but you don't find any of these really self-conscious statements and treatises on, uh, on politics, uh, on, um, on international relations, on war, on any, anything like that. What you, find, um, what you find is letters, right? You find uh, letters back and forth to one another. We, we have an, an enormous uh, um, corpus of diplomatic correspondence from the ancient Near East. Um, and, and that's a very different thing than, than saying, well, let me, you know, then, then um, um, you know, the, then really, you know, reading something like the Melian Dialogue or, or you know, something that, that again is more self-consciously a, a treatise on, on one of these themes. So, um, but you, you know, I, one of the things I, and, and, I, and I, this is, I want, I want to be very careful about what I'm saying here, because whenever anybody talks about Israel or, or, uh, um, or uh, you know, whether it's ancient Israel or Jerusalem or, or anything like that, uh, people can go off on any direction and, and, and get very angry because you're neglecting the Palestinians or you're, you're anti-Semitic or, or whatever. Um, but I, so, so I want you to be very careful about what you hear and I want to be very careful about what I say. There is an incredible, um, in, incredible rich uh, political understanding of, uh, of life that is communicated often in, uh, in biblical texts. And, and I'm not here to tell everybody that, you know, they need to convert to Christianity or Judaism or, or anything, okay? I'm just saying that there is, there's a lot of political wisdom in these things um, that you don't get in, uh, in, in what we call the Western sources. Um, some people would say that the Hebrew Bible is a Western source. It's not, not at all. Um, you might say that it's been interpreted in a way that is Western, um, but, uh, but it's certainly not a Western source. So, uh, and let me give you an example so you get a better sense of what I mean. Um, in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, there's, there's a, there are passages that we call the law of the king, okay? And it's, it's a source that we believe was taken and, and, and integrated with, uh, with the rest of uh, the text that it's in and around. Um, and the law of the king restrains, it, it restrains, okay, it restrains the power of the king. That's, that's pretty powerful, you know, political philosophy there. Um, that, uh, that, that people saw the problem of an all-powerful ruler and then built up hedges around it so that it could be effective and constructive without being so narcissistic that it was destructive, okay? So, um, so there's, there's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of, of you know, uh, political information and wisdom in these texts, and that's an example of it, uh, of one, or at least that's one example of it, um, that, uh, uh, that are not classically or in, in any other sense, you know, Western. So, so th there's one example. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's a very, uh, very insightful answer to that. Um, interesting question. Uh, I'll, I'll go with one more question since we're running a little bit short on time at this point, then I'll open it up actually to both uh, Dr. Edgar and Mike uh, to answer, answer one of these other questions that I think is very applicable uh, to both of you. But um, Dr. Edgar, so just kind of given the current state of affairs in, uh, in the domestic job market, of course, um, how secure would you say that social science and international relations jobs are? And then it kind of, I guess, an addendum to that, that um, another delegate had asked was, would you recommend doing a dual degree in history and international relations? Right. So any of those things are good, okay? Any of those things are constructive, especially if you get good teachers. Um, and, uh, and you're going to a school where teachers take time and interest 
in you. All right. Um, and you get involved with something like the Clement Center. Again, I'm not trying, you know, this is not, in, this is not an intentional pitch. Okay. But uh, here at the Clement Center at the University of Texas, we take time. Uh, we especially take time for our undergraduate fellows like Ross, but we take time for anybody who comes in, any undergraduate who comes in, we will work with them to identify, um, you know, we, we don't, I don't have a drawer here full of jobs that I can hand out. I wish I did. Um, and some of you may have heard me say that before, but, uh, um, but we work with them to get internships and we work with them to identify, um, to identify jobs, apply for jobs, prepare for applications, um, prepare cover letters. We do, we, we do all that sort of thing. So find a place that cares about you enough to take that kind of time with you, okay? Not just to educate you during your three hours of classwork, uh, you know, course coursework each week uh, and give you a, a thousand pages to read over the weekend, um, never mind whether you understood it or not, okay? Find a place um, uh, and a program, whether it's history, IR, or history and IR, or you know, some some people end up getting three degrees all at once. It's you you people are super talented, okay? Some of you do that, um, uh, but also find a place um, or find people where you go that are going to take the time to help you consider the job market and prepare for the job market. Um, now, let me go back to the kind of the first part of that question is, you know, with kind of wither social sciences, right? <laughs> so, so social sciences are, are, are certainly valuable, okay? Um, within, within context, like anything within context. Uh, but um, becoming a social scientist by discipline is a very, very different thing than studying social science and then going to be a foreign service officer in the state department, okay? So, <clears throat> so if, you, if you wanna become a social scientist by discipline, uh, the academic job market is incredibly tough right now. And it's probably gonna be tough for another decade or two. So if you do that, make sure you really love what you're doing um, and that you love what you're doing, uh, regardless of what you're making. But if you if you just want to use it to to learn and grow and understand, and then go do something else where those that knowledge is useful, but it's not necessarily um, you know, discipline as far as a discipline, um, what it is that you do every day. Then, then I don't think you have much to worry about because there's lots of, you know, the, the, the job market will go up, the job market will go down. You got to be a little bit scrappy and, and you can be okay. You also yes, understand yeah. that you, you don't find something, you know, you don't find your dream job a week after you graduate. Go do something productive. Go do something productive, hard work, maybe, you know, heck, Peace Corps, right? Peace Corps is a hard job. Um, and it's, it can be thankless in a lot of ways, but it also provides opportunities later on. So, so there's a lot, and there's lots of things like that to do. And, and I don't want to cut too much into anybody else's time. Yeah. I mean, I'll touch on this a little bit during my presentation, but I do think that, look, I was a political science, international affairs major. I had a bunch of friends that were as well, the ability to empathize, to understand other cultures, to kind of get what makes them tick, to be open to new ideas. Um, they're now working in marketing. They went to work for you know, NGOs like I did on human rights things or on environmental issues. Uh, regulatory affairs departments at major companies are always hiring people with international affairs degrees because somebody has to be aware of what's going on in the regulatory environment in China or EU with GDPR. You, know, you don't have to go and get a law degree or a master's degree like I did to do that. There's a lot of other jobs if you think creatively about the skill sets you're building that right. you can then apply to just about anything. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very much. Um, another question, you know, and, and Dr. Edgar, thank you for being here. You can stick around. This question kind of goes to you uh, and Mike both. Um, but I, so I guess one of our delegates asked, how can leaders work to unite their people, especially given if their people are deeply divided and in discord? Um, you know, very, very timely question, especially given the events of the last few weeks in this country. Um, how can two different sides learn to compromise um, and respect each other realistically. 
Like, We'd have a Nobel Peace Prize if we knew the answer. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll say this, and I touch on a little bit in my remarks next. Um, again, I, I always come back to empathy and I come back to, you know, it's willing to have your position and it's well reasoned and you get it and you can't understand why anybody else would take a different one. But even if you disagree fundamentally with the person that you're talking to, trying to get behind that position to understand where they're coming from. What was it that maybe led them in their life to be in that position? Um, you know, maybe they're taking a, a position that they don't even necessarily believe in, but there are external factors that they feel are forcing them to sort of stand up for that, for that particular position that you disagree with. Understanding what's going on and finding smaller avenues, you know, water finds its way through a stone eventually, finding avenues to engage in a more productive fashion will come from that, but fundamentally it can't be just a, you know, compromise doesn't, doesn't mean the other side has to give away something and I get to keep everything. That's not how this works. And part of that is just sitting down and having that dialogue to truly understand what is, what do they really want versus what they're saying and how they're articulating it. Cause it can be two very, very different things. At the end of the day, everybody wants to feel like they're productive, you know, have a job, provide for their families and all the other things, you know, have a sense of status and worth in our society they may, some people may just be expressing it in entirely polar opposite ways, but fundamentally when you talk about what are you really looking for here, you might find a ton of common ground. Very true. Yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, Dr. Edgar, if you have anything to add to that, we're going to, I'll kind of segue into, into your uh, section, Mike, uh, sure. and then we can, you know, we, I'm sure we'll have some questions later where, um, you know, that might be applicable to both of you. I don't know if Dr. Edgar, you have to hop off. Um, I don't want to cut into your afternoon too much but um you know regardless thank you thank you for being here but if you have anything to add yeah, go ahead uh i'll just uh i'll give a 30 minute i'm not 30 minute 30 seconds and uh and then i'll, I'll stay on um if it's uh and uh but um watch let, let's just talk domestically for a moment um watch and see what this democratic administration does um, not just to communicate empathy, but a, to actually compromise. If it, if it actually compromises, that's a huge step that nobody, that it feels like nobody's taken in, 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 in I don't know, two or three or four administrations, okay? Um, if they actually compromise, say, you know what, this is our political goal and we are going to sacrifice it entirely or partially because you disagree. See if that happens. Um, certainly didn't happen uh, that I saw with the, the last administration. Uh, didn't happen, um, at least in, in, in my view, didn't really happen with the Obama administration and didn't really happen with the Bush administration. Okay, you probably have to go back to, you probably have to go back to, uh, to President Clinton to find some honest, um, honest compromise uh, and um, lots of reasons for that, but I'll stop here. Very true. So we'll, yeah, we'll have to see how things transpire over the next, next uh, four years or just the next hundred days of this administration. But uh, Mike, you know, the, the floor is all yours. I'll, I'll introduce Mike Lundberg. He's our next, uh, our next speaker. So uh, former high school and Yale University Model United Nations participants. So very you know, appropriate for this conference. I'll just go ahead and dive in. Uh, I'll introduce myself as part of the presentation. So um, I just called this one from Model UN to the Real UN. Uh, because fundamentally, as, as Ross was saying, I, I grew up a Model UN nerd. Uh, I've done Model UN uh, for years through high school as well as through college. And really, truly fundamentally, you know, the things that I learned, the skill sets I learned through Model UN, the experiences that I was opened up to through Model UN fundamentally transformed who I was and sort of how I approached the world and the kind of career path that I went into. So without uh, any more further ado, so look, uh, quick backstory to me. Uh, I grew up in Southern California, son of a cop, not an international family, never had passports. Uh, but for whatever reason, you know, maybe because I was a kid actor, I liked playing with funny accents. I got interested in sort of what was going on in the world a little bit. And then when I got to high school, rather than doing your AP US history, you know, AP, you know, international affairs, whatever, um, decided that I was do model UN because it sounded interesting. I like to put on a show, I like to debate, you know, why not bring it all together? And fundamentally, the, uh, the things I learned about debate, about empathy, about playing the part, about learning your audience, about, you know, how to craft something that can be compromised for everybody, really got foreign in my time in high school. 
So thoroughly enjoyed it, thoroughly loved it. In fact, my college admissions essays were about an experience I had debating somebody at the Singapore uh, embassy in DC when I was there for the Georgetown conference. Uh, that then led me to college where again, like Ross said, I was part of the traveling UN team. I was secretary general of our security council simulation. I mean, I played sports, but realized early on that was not gonna be a career path for me. That in fact, my sort of love for international affairs, my international friend group, the ability to travel, to speak foreign languages like Spanish and Portuguese, all these things were just kind of coming together that really international affairs of some form was going to be in my career path. So, you know, like every college senior, I was getting towards graduating. I'd taken the LSAT prep courses to go to law school. I chickened out at the last minute and said, what am I going to do with my life? Well, shoot, let's go ahead and get a master's degree in international relations. You know, I'd wanted to study abroad anyway, so here's my great excuse. So I ended up going to London School of Economics. Um, I got my master's degree in international relations. Uh, my undergrad degree was in political science, but really was a massive focus on sort of not so much the, the history was part of it, but also like the functioning of international organizations. So I took a ton of classes on how the United Nations works, how the European Union works, you know, uh, international law and non-governmental organizations, human rights organizations, sort of how the international community kind of operates as a holistic whole. That was sort of my focus. And I'd say, you know, I wrote my senior thesis on UN sanctions law and the role of UN sanctions on diamonds and helping bring to the end uh, the civil war in Angola. So then kind of parlay that into my master's degree at LSE, again, focusing this time more on sort of civil society and how, you know, post-war, um, sort of, I guess, post uh, in the reconciliation phase and the reformation phase of a country after decolonialization, you know, how can you build up a society that can sustain itself? How do you build capacity? How do you ensure that all the good governance things you're trying to put in place through a UN peacekeeping mission can actually continue? That was sort of my focus there. Uh, ended up falling in love with London, did not want to come back to the States, wasn't ready to grow up yet. So then I got my first job, which was at an NGO called Global Witness. Uh, and GW is it's a Nobel Prize nominated NGO based in London. And their remit is looking at the nexus between conflict resources and conflict. So looking at blood diamonds, blood timber, and the way that you know rebel groups are very rarely led by a true believer more often than not, they have a small army of true believers, but a lot of the folks that are involved are really, you know, Western interests, financial interests, people looking to make a buck, who then just sort of cover themselves with this overlay of, oh, I'm really into this position or into this, this leader. A lot of times what's driving the conflict behind the scenes and logistically as part of the conflict itself are these financial interests that people have. So this is the more interesting bit of my career uh, from ages, what, 22 to 25 that I'll focus on on the next slide, but just to kind of show my progression. So looking for jobs out of undergrad or out of grad school in international affairs, absolutely go looking at groups like Greenpeace, Global Witness, uh, Amnesty International. You know, there's, those are the major ones, but there are also a lot of smaller ones that are either just focused in the US or regionally focused that you should absolutely be looking for. There are tons of lister listers out there that you can get on uh, for hiring for international organizations, looking for volunteers or looking for you know, junior entry level people. Sign up to those, get the email blasts. DevNet jobs is a big one as well. Just whatever, get on as many listers as you can to find as many opportunities and apply for them all. Uh, then after uh, a number of years at GW in London, mucking around West Africa, which I'll get into, Decided I was tired of getting sick on every trip. Uh, I was tired of, frankly, looking back at it, being in a lot of danger. Uh, so I ended up giving up for the glamour of the law. Uh, I went to Georgetown for law school, convinced that I was going to be a human rights attorney and continue my nonprofit ways. I uh, decided partway through that, in fact, what I really found interesting was applying that sort of human rights -y mindset to actual business. So looking at compliance work. So the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, securities trading litigation, what can I do as part of my investigative background and sort of call it higher moral authority and higher ethical compass to try and hold people accountable for their wrong actions. So I ended up becoming a white collar defense attorney uh, working at a big firm in Los, based in Los Angeles, but global called Latham and Watkins for almost eight years where I you know, was an associate focusing on white collar crime. And for eight years, I effectively did my not exclusively, but almost exclusively, my sort of uh, career was made up of internal investigations, primarily for overseas companies uh, facing investigation in the US and Europe on bribery charges. 
So a lot of multicultural engagement, a lot of understanding, you know, why something might seem entirely deplorable under US law, but was actually a tax write-off in the country at issue and trying to slowly play part lawyer, part psychologist to folks to kind of make them understand why they're good people, but somebody somewhere thinks you're a really bad person who should go away for 20 years and pay a $300 million fine. So you're kind of balancing things there at Latham. And then I decided that eight years of working at, you know, uh, a very nice sweatshop uh, was enough for me. And then I decided that I was actually going to go in-house. And so for the last five years, I have been an in-house compliance attorney at a global energy company based here in lovely, sunny Miami, Florida. So again, these are all things and skill sets that you can take with you around your career. Uh, geographically, thanks Siri, uh, geographically, uh, as well as in sort of different segments of work. So just because frankly, it is probably the most interesting job I will ever have. And it really does sort of show how Maldi Wen comes into the real world. Let me talk to you about my, my time at Global Witness. So I call this from research to resolution, the evolution of an effort. So when I joined Global Witness, again, I was just a volunteer at first. I was not getting paid. And that's another sort of career tip for you guys. If you can, you know, take your student loans, if you can work for the summers and save up your money, if you can dedicate three or four months of free labor to an organization, it is far more likely that once you're in and they like you and you've proven yourself, they will hire you for a permanent position. Here, I was working in London. I didn't have a work permit. I was a foreigner, technically there as a tourist, but I showed up every day. I worked really hard on a number of campaigns and they started a new one on Liberia in 2002. And the issue in Liberia, if you don't know the, the history of the civil war in Sierra Leone and Liberia, basically the gentleman on the left uh, in the hat, Charles Taylor, is the former president and dictator of Liberia, a country in West Africa, originally founded by freed American slaves. Uh, a very greedy man who basically wanted to gain access to the diamond mines of nearby Sierra Leone. And the way that he found to do that to enrich himself was to start funding both with money and with weapons and with support uh, rebel groups in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, and next door in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And what was driving that first off was his interest in earning money through the diamond mines in Sierra Leone, but then later on also exploiting his timber resources within Liberia, which is sort of where I come into the picture. So you see Charles Taylor there on the left, uh, the white guy on the right hand side in the yellow shirt, that's Gus Cohenhoven. He is a Dutch, now former timber merchant uh, who has been convicted on war crimes under the Dutch law. Uh, and uh, is facing prison time, I think, for 19 years now. And the reason I got into this was not because of the academic interests uh, and not just because I wanted a job, but for like the picture on the right. You know, this is a child soldier in Sierra Leone. This is somebody who was forcibly taken from his home, possibly forced to kill his family members, uh, chop off the hands of relatives, set fire to his own village, all because of the greed of certain individuals like the guys on the left but also because the international community let this happen because the resources that were being exploited uh, were going to Western markets, they were going to China, uh, they're going to the United States, and nobody was really trying to break that link between the consumer goods that people wanted in the West and the source of, that, of the, the raw goods, which was a conflict somewhere in, you know, in West Africa. So that's how I got interested, more from an emotional perspective. Uh, this is me on my very first trip uh, in upcountry West Africa. Uh, so we are part of a, an NGO. We were independent, but we did have a lot of friends on the ground at various other nonprofits or folks who were working for the UN mission. So on this trip in particular, hitched a ride on an antiquated ancient Ukrainian UN helicopter to fly up into the corner of the border between Sierra Leone and Liberia. Um, I call this my CNN picture uh, because I'm carrying my notepad because I was always talking to people. And also because the bag over my left shoulder uh, held pens and papers and things like that, but was also a hidden camera. So a lot of the investigations that I would do would be undercover. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, because of the organization I worked for, we could not go to Liberia. We would not have gotten out had we gone in. But what we would do is, you know, first stop, go to the UN, you know, mission in sight, get a visitor ID badge, and then use, you know, a fingernail polish remover to take off the visitor ink so it looked like an actual badge. Uh, we had fake business cards. We had, you know, different sort of stories that we would tell people. I was a PhD student or I was a UN volunteer or something like that to get up country, to talk to people, to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, that was the small part that we played from the organization. 
we very largely relied on uh, a small army of very dedicated um, undercover sort of sources within Liberia who every day risked their lives to gather information for us. So taking pictures of weapons coming into the country, taking pictures of logging ships that were taking you know, the wood out of the country, getting ship manifests of the weapons or ship manifests of who was buying the timber that was on board. You know, none of this would have happened without the help of people on the ground. And it was the ability to go and meet with them on site and to build these relationships. And frankly, just to let the bad guys run their mouths, uh, which they love to do, helped us build up uh, you know, a set of data that we then put into reports like this one. So we put out a series of reports for the media, but also put out a series of reports that we then went and lobbied the UN Security Council with. So I would say I'd spent, for the years I was at GW, three months a year in West Africa doing investigations, three months writing up these reports and spending way too much time with attorneys going over the fine points of libel law, and then three months in New York or DC lobbying the UN Security Council and the US State Department. So as an MUN geek growing up, the idea of actually going and sitting down with an ambassador to the UN in their offices, or even better yet, in the antechamber just off to the side of the Security Council itself was a little mind blowing, incredibly humbling, but also super exciting because you know after years of working with our local sources and lobbying and hitting up the Russians, I've, I have gone head to head with Sergey Lavrov. He's a tough guy to talk to. Uh, going head to head with your, your friends in the US, the UK, the Chinese who would never tell you exactly how they felt, the French who were up for anything, you know, it's just this back and forth that you always had to go through for years. And then wouldn't you know it, in uh, 2003, the UN Security Council actually took on our arguments, took our recommendation and sanctioned the Liberian timber. And within months, Charles Taylor was, he lost his source of foreign income. He had lost the logistical support that came with the logging industry. So logging companies like Gus's, they had paramilitary forces, had weapons operating on Charles Taylor's behalf. You had the weapons coming in on logging ships, taking logs back out to Denmark, uh, to China for processing, and were able to shut that down. So incredible moment. And then you transition from, oh my God, there's actually sanctions in place to enforcing sanctions. And then Taylor's gone and then war crimes trials and then trying to figure out, well, how do we actually ensure this peace lasts? And how do we ensure that we don't fall into the old bad behaviors? You know, uh, to Dr. Egger's point, you know, the common themes, the common failures through history, let's try and make sure that the new people in town, the new people in charge don't repeat them. Um, I won't say that it was all tough going. So one of the groups that we collaborated with a lot at Global Witness was Greenpeace. They came at the issue from the environmental side. We came at it from sort of the financial logistical side to, to mutual success. And we were actually invited to go on the Greenpeace Warrior 2, or, or Rainbow Warrior 2 once, to go sailing around the Mediterranean to try and chase down some ships that we thought had Liberian conflict timber on it. Didn't catch any, didn't get to, uh, you know, shackle myself to anyone's vessel, but still kind of an exciting way to sort of wrap up the campaign that we had. And then for me, the crowning achievement was my first year of law school, I got an email from a very long last name from the Dutch prosecutor's office requesting my presence to testify in the war crimes trial of Gus Cohenhoven because the uh, Dutch government had decided to prosecute him for the crimes he had committed in Liberia. Had no counsel, didn't have an attorney, first year law student trying to figure out what was going on here, um, but ended up in a conference room at the State Department with the judge, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and a court stenographer, and a whole little audience of State Department folks who worked the West Africa desk in there as I had to testify about the horrible things this guy had done and to also ensure that in sharing the information, we were able to sort of create new case law in the Netherlands where we could protect our confidential sources. Because even to this day, frankly, if they were known who they were, their lives could be in danger. So there's a lot of law works very slowly. There are a lot of appeals. He was, you know, appeal was overturned and conviction was overturned, but now his final conviction has been upheld, which is fantastic. So some accountability, that's the whole reason I went into law. A little bit of accountability goes a long way. So like in closing for me, you know, some of you guys are there just because look, it's easier than AP US history. I get it, totally makes sense to me. Some of you are here because you really have a sort of a nascent interest in international affairs, nurture that. But whatever reason you're here, there's a lot of skills if you actively engage in multi UN that you're gonna pick up. One is networking. I still hate going into a room of people that I don't know and trying to make friends with them, but it's necessary. If you're gonna be an NGO worker, if you're gonna build a base of data points and contacts, you've gotta be able to talk to people. MUN has been great for that. 
even if can't do it over zoom, but in the old days when you're in person, you know, the couple of kids sitting in the back, those are the easiest ones to go to, to get to sign on to your resolution, new friends, and you build out from there, right? You find your way in, you get started, you get more comfortable and you get better at what you do. Again, playing to the audience. Like I said, you have to know the argument that's going to work for the people you're talking to. If we had gone in and said, you need to do this for human rights purposes to all members of the security council would have gotten nowhere except for maybe five or six of them. You have to have a targeted message that gets at the right things people are concerned about. Some are worried about their reputation. Some are worried about the economic blowback. Others are worried about the human rights issue. You've just got to figure out what works to make your argument to get where you want to go. Um, so we said before, knowing when to compromise and knowing when to stand firm. Look, there are certain things we couldn't compromise on from a position perspective, but there are other things where, look, you can, in terms of duration of sanctions or who gets to monitor or what the, if you want to have a monitored sort of industry with you know, smaller exports, there are ways that you can compromise to try and build a coalition to get something done. Um, resilience, I can't tell you how many times we met with the same exact ambassador or the same sub to sub to sub to Charles de Fer before we actually got some action done, but it was that repeat meeting. It was that constant talking to somebody. It was that I'm going to put up for 45 minutes of you talking at me before I can get my 15 minutes of like my cell in, and then it actually works out well for you. Um, clever drafting, word choices, words matter. How you word something can make a difference. One word can have 15 different meetings, and if it's vague and that works for you guys, fantastic. That can be great. But if it's vague and people can abuse it, that's a problem. Things you have to worry about. Um, two more things, empathy, like I said, one thing MUN teaches you is the position of Chile and the position of China and the position of Australia on a particular subject could be diametrically opposed, but understanding where they're coming from, why they have a particular concern or lack thereof, or why they're taking a position or not leads into how you interact with humans as well. And so trying to think behind, get behind their psychology, understand that they may just be a mouthpiece for something bigger than them. So it's not personal. So then trying to appreciate that and recognizing that and still trying to find ways where you can work together was massively important for me in my career, both in law as well as when I was a global witness. And then finally, look, knowing that anybody can make a difference. If a kid from Southern California, who's the son of a cop who didn't have a passport, can end up working in upcountry West, West Africa, in Liberia, helping take down warlords and, and dictators and getting you in sanctions uh, resolutions passed, anything is possible. So if you apply yourself to it and you think big enough, and you get a little bit of luck and have some really good mentors along the way, anything is possible. So. Well, thank you so much. That's my spiel. That was awesome. That, that was fantastic, Mike. That was great. I, I also, I apologize. I think the internet or something with the Zoom keeps kept kick, kicking me off the, the Zoom call a few times. So I just like, all I good. joined, I was like, you're already presenting. <laughs> so, welcome, welcome to um, my daily life where I'm always getting kicked off Zoom calls. Sometimes yeah. it helps, sometimes it's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's no fun. Um, we will now jump into Q&A. I think we're going to go over time a little bit. So, um, you know, Doug, right. feel free to, to stay on. I know the lunch break is from uh, 12.30 to 1.30. We don't want that to, to cut into your lunch. But if you're interested, stick on on the call and we'll, we'll do some Q&A. So first question is from Germany. Um, so Germany says, if you're hesitant to go into the action but still believe in the message of organizations like Global Witness, are there other options that are more behind the scenes. Yeah, so I mean, like at Global Witness, most of our team would not go in the field. Uh, you know, we had a ton of support staff in London and our other offices that were helping, you know, work on anything from like, for example, if you're a, you're a finance major, we had a whole finance team and a grant writing team. If you're an English major, my God, every nonprofit needs a really good person to help out with their grants and craft a compelling story to get money from the donors. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to support it not just on, say, the international relations side of things, but whatever skill set you have, you can apply to an organization like that. And we were in desperate need of people with a finance background, an IT background, um, you know, a grant writing background all the time, because those, it's one thing to be able to go and you know, craft a report and go you know, run around the hidden camera being stupid. It's another thing to actually be able to turn that into making the organization function as a whole. Great. Um, so this question, you know, can go to, to either you, Mike, or, or Dr. Edgar. But, um, you know, when, if ever, was the first time that you considered giving up your job because of security risks and what made you stay in your job? I mean, I'll take it from my side because the army is a whole different story. Uh, so for me, I, I never really, I never thought about giving up my role because of security risks. I mean, I was in my early 20s. It was all kind of exciting. You knew it was risky. We never had security with us. It was just me and a partner every time 
on our own. Um, I was more concerned about needing to not do certain things because of the security risk it could pose to our sources in country. Uh, and then frankly, also at the end of the day, I just got really sick on every single trip, like guaranteed every single time I got sick. And we were down there for four or five or six weeks at a stretch, which makes for a very long trip away from home. And look, after a while, like we got the sanctions in place, Taylor was gone. It was now moving into different sort of reconstruction and monitoring phase, which was not what I was interested in, in doing. So that was the natural way, time for me to segue back and go to law school. Doctor, I'll, I'll just say I'm, I'm not, um, it, it, look, we're, we're all at risk and, um, and our tolerances for risk are just different. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've certainly been in some uncomfortable situations that I would rather have not been in, but, uh, but I never, um, you know, I never, I never questioned what I was doing, uh, e enough to, to make me change careers. And, and I would just also say that, um, everybody, you know, it, sort of, you hear this in movies, right? Everybody's afraid. It's just those who over, you know, they have some phrase that, about overcoming your fear, right? You know, don't go ahead and be afraid, but still do the hard things. Find an opportunity to do the hard things. I'm not saying be stupid, okay, and go run in the light of fire. Um, you, you shouldn't do that, even if you're in the army. But, um, but, uh, but do take, you know, push yourself to take a little bit of risk to make yourself more uncomfortable, um, even if it's only for, you know, a month or a week or whatever, make yourself more uncomfortable than you want to be. Uh, it, test the waters a little bit. And, and you might find that um, you know, not only it's safer than you thought, but also you may have a, a taste for things that you didn't expect. Definitely, that's, that's great. Um couple other questions. I'll kind of combine two of these um, for you, Mike. So mm -hmm. first one is uh, one of our delegates asked, how stable is working for an NGO? Can you be somebody that's comfortably employed directly out of college? Um, and then kind of as an addition to that, um, if you want to go the medical route, how can you contribute to the United Nations or adapt medicine to a career like yours? Sure. So on the NGO front, I mean, it's been a long time since I worked for an NGO, but you know, Global Witness is still there 30 years on. So you know, I think it depends on the group. Uh, you know, I, I, I found it stable. You know, it's not the best paid work. You're not going to make six figures generally working at a nonprofit, but that's not why you do it. Um, you know, I was doing it because I cared about the cause, because I wanted the experience, because it got me a work permit when I was living in London and otherwise it'd have to move back to the States. Like there's all kinds of reasons why you can work for an NGO. Um, you know, I, there are the bigger ones that are obviously the most well-funded. Um, you can go on something like the Open Society Institute and see the organizations that they fund. They're always very good, generous, consistent funders. So if they're an organi they fund an organization, they're likely to be well-managed and ready to hang around for a while. Um, and on the medical side, I mean, look, obviously, you know, there's MSF, Medicine Sans Frontières. There's um, all kinds of charities that do work on the medical side. So... If you wanted to go on the front lines, work in West Africa uh, you know, with Caritas or with um, so Red Crescent, Red Cross or groups like that, there's all kinds of groups that will take you even on a volunteer basis. Um, or if you wanted to work full time as a medical person, just find a group like a Greenpeace or somebody who's out there regularly in the field. They're going to need somebody you know, to advise them from a medical perspective on a risk perspective, who's going to be able to hop on a, a plane and help people out if they need it. So, I mean, definitely there's lots of opportunity there, not just medical charities, but also regular charities that might be large enough to have like a medical arm to it. I definitely recommend that. Um, by the way, one other point that question was raised earlier on by someone called Kyra uh, or Kara about concern about whitewashing history and international affairs and how to get around it. I helped get around it because I selected my professors a certain way. And when I went to LSE, I wanted to study abroad and I wanted to take from certain professors who I had researched, who I knew had sort of progressive view on things um, and also was looking for opportunities to cross study to other universities like an HBC and things like that. So there's ways that you can get around it. It just takes a little bit of research on your side too. But I wanted to make sure I answered that question. Um, Ross seems to have frozen, but I'm seeing other questions coming through. One on, you know, in terms of internships, Look, a lot of these groups do offer internships. They don't offer very many. So a lot of it is, frankly, more than anything, work your professors 
if you have a connection, like anything in life, if you have a connection to the company or to the organization that you can work, an old college buddy of your professor or something like that, work it. That's your best way of getting in. Sending a blank resume you know, to a LinkedIn site is not probably going to get you the job. But if you have somebody, you know somebody on the inside, you can volunteer first, you can find a way of making a connection with the hiring person. That's the best way to, to try and get an internship. That's what I found. I mean, I had to work it. I got very lucky, but it was also, I knew somebody who knew somebody who could mention my name offhand, or I knew somebody who happened to know somebody we never really connected, but dropping of a name can open up a lot of doors. All right. Well, I, I just got, got kicked off the Zoom call again, <laughs> rejoined. Here I am again. Let's, we'll, we'll try to wrap this up uh, pretty soon, but here's another question actually that I think can, can go to uh, you know, either you, Mike, or, or Dr. Edgar. Um, and it's just kind of a, a very a general question, but with regards to public speaking, and that can, you know, be with whether it's in academia with, with Dr. Edgar or something more in, right, in law and diplomacy uh, with you, Mike, but how do you respond to a question that can, just catches you off guard um, or you don't have an immediate reply to, how do you remain um, or retain that, you know, professionalism throughout, um, throughout your job and dealing with others? Well, I'll take one quickly. So I used to do the media work for the company for my campaign. And it was often that somebody was on an unclear line or they asked a question in a way that I just didn't want to answer. And so my, my first topic, even in multi one, whenever I used to get up to do a speech was just take a moment. And for me, it's, I'm not myself. I'm kind of playing a role. And as a former actor, it's sort of like, I'm up here giving a speech as opposed to I'm like off the cuff and I have to be on the defense. I'm like, no, I am, I'm giving a presentation. I'm playing a role. I have a speech prepared kind of in your mind of your talking points. And so if you ever like, they ask a question that you don't like, be a, you know, a typical politician and answer the question you do want to answer. And so to pivot away from it, so that's a really great question. And relatedly, go into answering, you know, what you really want to talk about that I use that pivot a ton. And otherwise just having, you know, you're in any interview and in any speech, having those two or three major key points you want them to walk away with. So at the end of the day, if they're having dinner with their families and they're remembering your conversation, there's one or two little points that stick in their mind that you really wanted them to remember. Very true. Um, Dr. Edgar, if you have anything to add to that, but um, you know, otherwise I think we, have exhausted most of the questions I think that that the delegates have, but this has been a really good, uh, good you know Q and A session, good breakout session. It's the first year that we've done any of this, so we're obviously kind of working out the the kinks of the technology, um, and and hopefully we won't have to do this virtually next year. But we definitely want to uh, to bring <clears throat> you know continue to bring speakers to to conference in future years. So thank you guys so much. I guess you know delegates, if you have any other questions just maybe stick around for for 30 seconds uh, a minute i'll, I'll say i think this now. is a great combination of experiences yep. right between the two of us i, I think that's uh um if, if you do stuff like this again um having people with very very different experiences that have dealt with um different things but in very similar environments or working on same similar problems but in very different ways I think that's uh, that's huge, and and uh, again, Mike, I thought your presentation was great, and uh, and I, I'll friend you on LinkedIn. Perfect. <laughs> and honestly, to that effect too, you know, uh, you got everyone can find me on LinkedIn. You know, my my Gmail account is out there. If anybody wants to reach out separately, directly with follow up questions, I'm always more than happy to take that stuff. More than happy to help out where I can, provide some ideas. You know, I've been through it before. I've lived it. It can be tough, but it can happen if you want it to happen. Definitely. Yeah. It's, so I, I'm, I'm glad that this worked out with, uh, you know, yesterday we had, um, you know, Dr. Edgar, you know, Dr. Golby. Um, and we, so we had him yesterday and we had a, another professor from UT Dallas, uh, Dr. Kim. So I think we tried to pair, you know, thematically some of the speakers who were more uh, in line with each other together. So hopefully this went well, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> you know, That's like great. I said, thank you guys so much for, for coming out. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks so much.